For generations, home ownership has been a central part of the American dream. But for many people, it still remains out of reach. This despite government programs and institutions created to help people become homeowners. Bloomberg reporters Heather Perlberg and Noah Buhire took a closer look at one of them, a system of banks called the Federal Home Loan Banks. They found that even though these institutions have billions of dollars to lend, Many home buyers still struggle to get approved for a mortgage. Heather and Noah spoke to home buyers across the country. I did give up. I had got to the point where this is not going to work. We're not going to get no house. Banks don't want to loan you the money. The banks, you know, they don't really tell you what you need to do or try to help you anyway. It's more of just like, no, we're not going to give you the loan. Today on The Big Take, does buying a house really need to be this hard? Heather visited Mississippi in the town of Drew for this story. I asked her to describe what she found when she arrived in the Mississippi Delta. Well, the Delta is really spread out and very rural. Some of these small towns are kind of smack dab in the middle of Jackson, Mississippi, and Memphis. There's just these little neighborhoods or little communities that are connected by long stretches of highway. There really aren't a lot of grocery stores. I mean, a lot of places like this are referred to as food deserts. The mayor of Drew told me that in January they got a Dollar General. So people finally have access to fresh produce, which wasn't an option before. They had to drive at least a half an hour just to get those kinds of groceries. And when you get to the actual neighborhoods, particularly the ones that we spent time in in Drew, there are just lighted homes everywhere. Also, you find in nearby towns like Greenville, these huge, huge plantations that were just passed down for generations. These are all owned by white families and uh, really feels like there are still very prominent white and black parts of town. Noah, Heather paints a pretty stark picture of what's happening in places like Drew. What were you trying to find out when you were reporting this story? Why did you go there? Yeah, I mean, the reason we were interested in this community is that we knew that there were a lot of people in this area that wanted to buy homes, but they just couldn't. They were getting shut out of the financial system. You've had banks basically retreat from a lot of parts of the country. So the same way Heather was talking about a food desert, we also have banking deserts in this country. So you can imagine the kind of, you know, headache it would be if you're working a full-time job to have to drive on a Saturday half an hour to 45 minutes away just to put your money in the bank. I mean, a lot of people just don't want to do that. I mean, these people, they don't have trouble being able to afford paying for these homes. They're paying rent that is sometimes more than they would pay for a mortgage payment monthly. But they don't have bank accounts. They do their banking at gas stations. They cash checks anywhere they possibly can. But they don't have credit history because they don't have credit cards. They don't have bank accounts. Uh, Sometimes they'll have one sort of bad medical bill they don't even realize is affecting their entire ability to qualify for a home loan. And credit scores are still such a huge marker for banks right now in the United States for whether or not someone is deserving of debt to buy a house. If you don't have access to just normal banking products, which is the case for a lot of folks in the Mississippi Delta and and frankly in a lot of rural and poorer areas of this country, It can be really hard to build credit history, which is just a precursor of getting a home loan and and buying a home, even if that home, as is the case in this part of Mississippi, may only cost $50,000, $60,000. But not everyone Heather and Noah talked to for this story had trouble accessing a nearby bank. Some were regular bank customers, and yet they still struggled to get approved for a mortgage. Heather, you spoke to one man, Andrew. Tell us about him. 
So James Green is a heavy machine operator in Sunflower County. My name is James Green, and I'm from Drew, Mississippi. He um, has been in Drew for a few decades now. He has a steady job, steady income. He's married. He has two kids. He's been trying to get a home loan for 12 or 13 years. Hasn't missed any rent payments and was really interested in buying a home, building wealth. Me and my wife, we always been trying to get a home. And that's one of the things that she wanted. So that made me start getting out looking. So he found a house he really liked. It was meaningful to him. He had rented it for years. His wife went into labor with a second child there. And still, even though he could afford it, wasn't able to get a home loan from any of the traditional banks in that area. Five different banks turned him down. And Regions Bank, which was very prominent down there, he was a customer, he tried three different times to get a home loan. And every time, same story, your credit score is too low. Your credit score is too low. I did give up. I had got to the point where... This not going to work. We're not going to get no house. It seems like people don't want to uh, sell the houses. Banks don't want to loan you the money. They're saying that your credit ain't good enough. And I'm like, man, I can go purchase a brand new vehicle with my credit. But y'all saying my credit ain't good enough. For someone like James Green, there is this whole federal program that's supposed to help people like him buy homes. Isn't that right? The federal government almost... A hundred years ago, during the depths of the Great Depression, came up with a plan to basically set up this network of home loan banks. The idea behind this network that Noah is describing was that these home loan banks can easily raise money with the government's backing by issuing bonds that investors buy up. And investors are willing to lend them money at basically the same rate as the U.S. Treasury borrows. Because their thinking is that if the federal home loan banks ever run into trouble, they're going to get bailed out by the federal government. And once the federal home loan banks raise that investor money, they lend it to other banks, banks that everyday people use. And those banks can then write more mortgages. So they then take that cheap money that they get and they lend it out to their members, which are banks, credit unions, insurance companies who can then go out and make home loans. This system's been around for a lot of years. Thousands of banks, ranging from small community lenders to the J.P. Morgan and Bank of Americas of the world, are part of this system. And there are 11 of these home loan banks around the country, and they have each have their own region. And so if you're a bank or a credit union in that region, you apply to be a member of that home loan bank. So, Heather, to what Noah is saying, when someone like James Green applies for a loan, how is the system supposed to work? And then how did it actually work? Well, because a lot of these banks have government-subsidized money that is intended to boost housing and mortgages in communities that need it most, you would think that banks like Regions, which at a time had $8 billion from the home loan banks, would be able to help someone like that. Uh, But it didn't happen for him until a community lender came to town. James Green eventually did get a mortgage, but it wasn't from any of these traditional banks that have borrowed billions and billions of dollars from the government subsidized system. It was a smaller community lender called Hope, which is a credit union and works to help promote home ownership in low income and black communities was a positive vibe when you walk through that door, you know, man, there's a change in here. It's something different. The managers in there, they greeting you with open arms. You're not sitting there 30 and 40 minutes and waiting just to speak with the manager and trying to handle your business in there and try to get along. They right on top of it. Things that you don't understand, they sitting there with you, walking you through it step by step. The bigger branches and stuff, they're not taking the time out just to sit there and walk you through all this and things that you're not able to get. They're not going to try to help you or tell you how you can go by getting it. But hope really care about their people. 
They really care about their customers that come through that door. So they worked with him to bring up his credit score. They gave him a mortgage for $50,000, and he bought that home, the one he was dreaming of, with three bedrooms, and for the first time in his life, this 48-year-old man is a homeowner. It was a happy moment, and I'm like, man, we did it. We really did it. My wife was happy. My kids was happy. You're looking at 10-plus years that we've been trying, and the weight just all of a sudden just disappeared off of your shoulders. After the break, why Hope Credit Union gave James Green a mortgage when other big lenders would not. The difficulty James Green had in getting a mortgage from Regions, the bigger bank in his area, isn't unique. Noah and Heather checked the data on who the bank gave mortgages to over the past five years. When we were looking at what they did in Mississippi, they lent more in wealthier census tracts, higher income census tracts, and to more white borrowers. Just to underscore that point, I mean, we went county by county through Mississippi and looked at the kinds of loans that Hope was making and who those borrowers were and who regions were. And you saw in county after county, double digit percentage differences between regions lending to black borrowers and Hope's lending to black borrowers. Hope just clearly has a focus on building wealth in the black community in a way that regions doesn't. And Just to be clear, Regions is not a crazy outlier within the financial system. They're lending at about the same rate to black borrowers that other lenders are in Mississippi. It's just that Hope is really much, much, much more focused on that. What did Regions say when you asked about their lending? They said that they do as much as they can for home buyers, regardless of their race. They said they donated several of these branches to Hope that they gave them money, cash to help with the renovations and the transition, and that they have other community programs that do help in the Mississippi Delta and other areas. A region spokesperson also told Bloomberg the company is actively serving the Mississippi Delta, including providing credit to people in low and moderate income areas. They said the bank chose to donate four properties to Hope because a community partner was in a better position to maintain services in specific communities. They said when banks like Regions support lenders like Hope, they collectively create results for individuals and communities. And they said it's misleading to directly compare the two types of lenders. Regions says it takes access to credit very seriously and wherever possible works with consumers who may not qualify for loans to help improve their financial strength. So this isn't something only happening in places like Drew, but really a broad thing that's happening across the country. You're seeing similar trends play out in places like rural Ohio or in New Mexico. And what we saw over and over and over again in the data and in talking to other financial institutions is that these community lenders like Hope do a much better job. They're doing a greater share of their mortgages in poorer areas. Absolutely. We talk to community lenders all over the place, other places that are doing a lot to help low-income people become homeowners. And this doesn't just affect Black home buyers. Heather spoke to a white woman in central Ohio about her challenges in buying a home. Hello, I'm Tara Carmichael. I'm from North Ohio. She is a single mom and had the same issues. She has a good job working in a hospital. She's an ultrasound tech and seemingly would be a good candidate for a home by all standards. I was just kind of done throwing away money and rent. I wanted something that I could invest in and make improvements to and a place for my family to put down roots. She told us her credit score was a 580 and she couldn't qualify for a home loan from any of the traditional banks in her area. The banks, you know, they don't really tell you what you need to do or try to help you anyway. It's more of just like, no, we're not going to give you the loan. 
so I needed a little assistance in getting myself in, in a place where I was actually able to qualify and be ready to purchase. So it wasn't until she found TrueCore, another credit union and community-focused lender, that really worked with her to bring that credit score up. They told her which credit cards to cancel, which accounts to close, and a year later she was up to a 680. So it really did work, but it took elbow grease. So now she is a first-time home buyer who's very happy and proud in Newark, Ohio. I was just relieved to have, you know, something of my own. We lived in a house. Um, it was a rental. It was on a busy street. We couldn't really make any changes to the property as it was. So it was nice to be able to get into our own home and put our personal touches on everything and the kids to have their own space. Noah. How are these community-focused banks able to issue so many loans to lower-income home buyers when the larger banks aren't doing it as much? You know, that's actually the crux of our story, is what you find is when you talk to these community lenders, their ability to go out and work with people like James Green and Tara Carmichael is really a function of how much they can borrow from the federal home loan banks. That's right. These community lenders are also borrowing money from the federal home loan banks, the banks set up by the federal government to spur mortgage lending. But as Heather and Noah learned in their reporting, when these community banks go to borrow from the federal home loan banks, they sometimes receive less money than larger banks. I asked Heather about that. These banks because they're smaller and they're lending to lower income Americans, they're just seen as riskier. They're seen as less financially stable and they're kind of treated as second-class citizens by these home loan banks. But are they riskier? Do these loans default at higher rates than other mortgages? No. If you look at the loss rates for a lot of these portfolios, they're less than 1%. They do a better job. They lose less money than the larger institutions who are lending. This is not just, you know, us saying this. You've got a credit rating firm like Fitch that went out and studied a lot of these, you know, community mission-focused lenders, and they found that they've had really, really low loss rates. They, by and large, function in safe and sound ways. If these community lenders like Hope and TrueCore aren't able to access as much of this money from the home loan banks as they want or need, it raises a question. What are the federal home loan banks doing with their money? They've sort of strayed from that mission where they were focused really entirely on housing. And these banks changed and started lending almost to help banks with any kind of needs that they might have. Heather and Noah report that the federal home loan banks became a go-to for big firms in need of quick cash at cheap rates. They gave billions of dollars in financial support to now-failed companies like Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. People stopped and kind of scratched their heads and thought, what are these banks playing in crypto and lending to the 1% and these niche institutions that really had nothing to do with home lending getting all of this government-subsidized cheap, cheap money? And that was part of what sparked our interest in this in the first place. When we come back, what a fix to this massive financial system might look like. Heather, how is it that this system, which was started explicitly to help people buy homes, now lends out so much of its money to things that have nothing to do with buying homes? That's just a flaw in the way the system operates. They are in this sort of nebulous area. They also have little quirks, like once you become a member, sort of like tenure if you're a professor. So you don't really get kicked out. And there are insurance companies that used to be a big part of the housing market 90 years ago when this thing was started that now don't give any home loans, but they got kind of grandfathered in. So now they're still benefiting from access to this really cheap money. But all of this is legal, we should say, is that right? It's all legal, yeah. 
So everyone's making a lot of money, including banks, smaller banks. And it's hard to shut something down or even change it a little bit when the status quo has been working quite well for some time. Noah, what do the federal home loan banks say about their lending? Basically, they say that they need to maintain tight credit standards to run institutions that don't fail and don't cost taxpayers money if they need to be bailed out, which, by the way, they have run safe institutions for a long time. They've lent a lot of money successfully over many, many years. And so basically what they're saying is that they're responding to the rules that Congress and their regulator have made for them over the years. And they're really focused on running safe institutions. They're regulated by the FHFA, which is the Federal Housing Finance Agency, the same group that oversees Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, if those names are more familiar. And Noah, what does this regulator have to say about how they're lending money? The FHFA has, for the past year, been studying the home loan bank system. Remember, this is a 90-plus-year-old institution. They are trying to make it work better. And when we put a series of detailed questions to them, they told us that they very much are interested in making the home loan banks work better for community-focused lenders, those that are actually helping to create home ownership opportunities. So there's likely more to come there, but a lot of this stems from Congress. You have to realize that this system has been around for so long, Congress has fiddled with it for years, and there are rules upon rules that have been codified over the years saying how the banks have to operate, who their members can be, how they can lend, what sort of collateral they can accept to make loans. And a lot of that, when you talk with experts in this field, they'll tell you it doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense anymore, or there's a lot of contradictions in the system. Because the mortgage market, frankly, has just changed a lot in the last 90 years, and lawmakers and regulators just haven't kept up with that change. What might the system look like if they changed it? What are some of the reforms they're considering? Well, frankly, we don't know. But some of the ideas that have been floating out there in in Washington are maybe to test periodically that the financial institutions that are members of the home loan banks, that they continue to be in the mortgage business. You have some institutions that have been in this system for a long time that have just really moved away from mortgage lending. And so maybe that shouldn't be. I think there are some things that have been discussed around the edges, which might make it cheaper and easier for some of these community lenders to borrow money from the system, to acknowledge the fact that they have good underwriting track records and should be able to get greater access to funds. Heather, we've heard how this system has affected people like James Green and Tara Carmichael. Are there broader implications to this system not operating as originally intended? Well, we're struggling with a huge affordable housing crisis. So it's hard to think about an institution that was set up directly to solve some of these problems that has the means to tackle a lot of this all throughout the country and is really falling short. And that's where a regulator like the FHFA can step in and really do something to change this if they choose to. Heather, Noah, thanks so much for sharing your reporting. Thank you. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Vergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producers are Michael Falero and Mo Barrow. This episode was edited by Caitlin Kenny. Raphael Amsili is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take.